Hey, good morning, good morning, church. Uh, you, it's week after week, right? And this is only the second week, but we start the series and you, you might think, man, what's the theological connection of what's love got to do with it? What's the it? What's the, fill it in for me. And then others of us just immediately jump to like, <laughs> and, and that's, then that's the only line of the song you know, right? Because the rest of it sounds exactly like, like what I just did. Just some syllables of, and that's, that's all you got. It's about all I got to. I didn't even know any other line of the song until I looked it up. <clears throat> if you want to open up your Bibles, go ahead and open up to our main text for this series, uh, 1 Corinthians 13. If you don't have a Bible with you, it's on your sermon notes. Or if you want to be really adventurous to look at a Bible you're not familiar with, we have them around the seats here. Uh, and as we're jumping into that, uh, consider some of what we will be looking at today. Today, we're going to talk about what it means to be kind. And in 2021, this tweet, and I'll tell you first place, I don't have a Twitter, so I just knew about the controversy. Uh, I don't care enough about that. I got enough things to do. Uh, this tweet went on Twitter, and it started a larger discussion about what it means to be nice and what it means to be kind. And so this person shared, when I describe East Coast and West Coast culture, don't know if those are East and West, East Coast and West Coast culture to my friends, I often say, the East Coast is kind, but not nice. And the West Coast is nice, but not kind. And East Coasters immediately get it, and West Coasters get mad. And it started this whole discussion of what's really the difference between kind and nice. And if, were you to be on Twitter at the time or to, like, to read through some of the comments following this, you would have seen some distinctions between niceness and kindness. And the big example that was used is somebody has a flat tire on the side of the road. And if you were just trying to be nice, you might drive by and say, hey, are you okay? Like, well, I got a flat tire. It's like... Well, I hope the tow truck gets there soon. I really hope that gets better. And it's really compassionate. And you see just like those, the, the eyes look at you of somebody and, man, I want your situation to be better. But then they drive away and don't really do anything. Maybe they can't, but maybe they don't. That would just maybe be some nice words. Kindness, maybe on the East Coast, would look like, hey, what's wrong with you? And then you say, well, I got a flat. It's like, fine, I'll help you out. How long is it going to take? You got your stuff? It's not very nice, but it is getting you back on the road. <laughs> and there's this distinction between kindness and niceness. And I would even say, if you've been to the East Coast and the West Coast, both of my parents are from the East Coast. My mom's from Boston, Massachusetts. This is a very true statement, <laughs> at least from my anecdotal evidence that, yes, I have experienced this. And on the other hand, and I've seen people pass by and do the very same thing I described. Somebody's on, on the side of the road is like, hey, are you okay? Okay, I hope it gets better. That niceness might just be a matter of maybe good talk, but not always action. But kindness, it might always be pleasant, might not always be pleasant, but it is certainly something that helps us get back on the road, not just with a spare tire, but maybe with whatever the situation is. And we might suggest that we as believers... Uh, ought to have a combination of those two things. And so kindness, when we look at this in Scripture, and then we're going to read our text and we're going to pray together before we start. Kindness, and you might want to fill this in, is the combination of being good-willed, some of those nice words we might find, being able to act, and then actually taking action. We actually have to follow through the whole process of, I want to do good, I'm able to do good, and I do the good. That there's no disconnect between the three. In fact, the word for kindness goes all the way back to this ancient Greek word that comes from the word hand. And the idea of that is that if you are kind, your hand will extend out to those who need it. And then that turned into a word for usefulness, and then that turned into the word of kindness. And so we've gone from I have hands to help, I have an ability to help, and now I'm going to do that out of goodwill. And that's turned into this idea of Christian kindness we have. Let's read our main text for this morning, 1 Corinthians 13, and we look at verses 4 through 7, where we're really going to hang out for the most of this. Joel gave us the whole passage last week, but this week we're really going to dive into a section 
uh, into really three words. Uh, we read, love is patient and kind. It does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Would you pray with me as we get started this morning? God, our Heavenly Father, we just give to you this morning our minds, hearts, and souls. Please help our minds be aware of just the thought processes happening, that we would change how we think about our lives, about our time, about how we act, about what we do. Help change our hearts in that we would no longer have feelings maybe of I don't care, of apathy, or of, of just a refusal or an indignance against doing something right. And I hope our souls, our inmost being, really believe that this is what we are called to do because it is. Help us see the connection, help us be different from the very moment we leave here forevermore forward. I pray that with all of our hearts. We pray this to Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right. So you might, if you grew up in the church, you might... Uh, Remember that there was a certain Sunday school application with uh, this post, or not this post, but with this, where'd it go? With uh, 1 Corinthians 13, where it says, love is patient, love is kind, it is not jealous, love does not brag, it is not arrogant. And you remember the really annoying thing that you would be asked to do with that? And Joel made mention of it last week, that we wouldn't say love is patient, or love is kind, and it is not je jealous. Is this ringing a painful bell in your mind of... Instead of saying love is, what if you put your own name there? Oh, and the conviction sinks in. I am patient. I am kind. I am not jealous. I do not brag, and I am not arrogant. Or if you make it really, really personal, Jason is patient. No, I, I'm, I'm okay with patient. Jason is kind. Okay, I got some work to do. Jason is not jealous. Okay, I got a little work to do there. Je Jason does not brag. Jason is not arrogant. Okay, I got some problems here. We might remember that maybe that was the, the application that we were given in our Sunday school classes or in our youth groups or maybe even just as we've heard this preached before. And it's frustrating because we know we don't really measure up sometimes. We know that we are not always these things that we ought to be. When we read about love in 1 Corinthians 13, you know, this is right in the middle of a section on spiritual gifts. And so right in the middle is the spiritual gift we are all gifted to do, which is to love as Christ loves. And how we fall short of that so very often. So we might ask this question. And this is what we want to answer this morning. Love is kind, but am I? I'll just tell you ahead of time, I know that none of us perfectly came out clean from this in the first place, and I know I don't. In fact, how, how funny and ironic is it? You know, you know the sense of irony that God has, especially like, if you think there's irony when you hear a message, imagine the irony that Joel and I feel when we preach a message. And, you know, my sister's in town, and I remember I was such a not kind brother growing up. Oh my goodness. So that's already a smack in the face. And so maybe we remember some of these places where we know we really ought to have been. But now we're called to so much more. And we, we know this. This is not just me that lived this way. Rem read what it says in Titus 3, 1 through 3. This reminder is given. Remind them, all people of God's people, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. Ready for every good deed is kind of synonymous with kindness. To slander no one, to not be contentious, to be gentle, showing every consideration for all people. For we too, oh, whenever this is written in scripture, how it stings. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. 
And we know when we reflect on our lives, apart from Christ, our best effort for kindness was falling short of the glory of God. And we know from our time in Romans and from some of the things we heard in Mark and from these last few years, this is no strange idea to us that falling short of the glory of God is deserving of wrath. So we really got a problem here. We're just, I know some of us are just reflecting a little bit because we know this is not who we are now. But even though we ought to be so much more in Christ, we know that we might still have some work to do. And I know when we say we, we don't just mean our own effort as if we're gonna become good enough, but rather that we, with our Lord and with the Holy Spirit in us, that there's, there's some work to do. And so as we go through this, Joel said last week, right, the way that we can see a perfect example of all of these things that love is from 1 Corinthians 13 is we have one best example, and this is, an, again, a reminder of Sunday school, the Sunday school answer for everything. It's Jesus, that he is the ultimate example of kindness, So as we look at a couple stories in the gospel, we will see the kindness of Jesus in a variety of ways. We'll see how we can respond to that. And hopefully that'll really spur us forward, encourage us, and push us into being so much more of the people God called us to be. So as we ask, how can we be kind like Jesus? One thing we can write down. One thing Jesus gave as an act of kindness was his presence to the Samaritan woman in John 4. And we might think, presence? What kind of good is that doing? Somebody just sits there next to me? They're not even doing anything. They just showed up and sat. Well, we might sometimes think that way, but we also know that the presence of a good friend or of a good person makes a big difference on a bad situation. One kind thing we see Jesus do, not just for the Samaritan woman, but over and over, is give his presence to people who were it to be measured up, had no place sitting next to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So we remember, you know, they were just leaving where they were and going. They went through Samaria, and so the Samaritan woman said to Jesus, once he sat down, how is it that you, though you are a Jew, are asking me for a drink, though I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. We remember we've heard this before, right, that the Jews didn't like Samaritans. The Gentiles didn't like Samaritans. For all intents and purposes here, nobody liked the Samaritans because they were this idea of half-breeded between God's people and not God's people, and they were thought of as dirty and unclean and unwanted and, and not good. And in light of all of that, Jesus in his kindness, chose to sit alongside her, giving his presence, his time, his words, even his ear to her situation. And of all the things he did, the things he told her, of all the things he heard from her, then we ended up with this just awesome moment at the end. And I know this is just, we've heard the story quite a bit. After everything that was done and Jesus said, I am the one that you are speaking of, the Messiah. So the woman left her water pot, water pot. She went into the city and she said to all the people, come, see a man who told me all things I have done. This is not the Christ, is he? That the kindness of God spurred something in her that the life she was living radically had to be changed. Do you remember when people might have done that in our lives before we came to believe? I remember well before Christ, I was very argumentative and not very kind sometimes. Sometimes it's just a nice way to say it. I wasn't always very kind. There were some very patient people that sat next to me and listened to me and talked with me and reasoned with me, especially when I was not reasonable. That presence and that kindness made such a difference. And we see the same thing as it's described in Romans. Romans 2, 4, do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness, of God's kindness, his restraint and patience, knowing that what's supposed to happen from this kindness, what's the change that's supposed to take place? The kindness of God leads you to repentance. Isn't that not the kindness that took place here? 
in John chapter four that we see that the woman, her life just changes around. Whatever she was doing, she had to change direction and do something entirely else. We see this with the woman caught in adultery in John chapter eight, that his kindness and Jesus's restraint and his patience with her led to go and sin no more. How exciting is that? And that this kindness is the thing that spurred it. So what is the thing that's like given here? It's the presence that Jesus had to this woman. The very presence that we find when we look forward and we see the cross. There's a kindness that was given in that moment where Jesus paid the price for our sins. That then his presence could be with us. That's an action that took place, right? Something was done there. That God was good-willed to us. That he was able to share his presence with us. And he did it. How awesome is that? And we see the same ideas of these, the presence of God being given to people and how nice that is. Like we see in the Proverbs, we imitate the wisdom of God here. That pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Think about what pleasant words that Jesus shared with the Samaritan woman. You know, when he said to her, go, get your husband, and she knew when she heard that she did not have a husband. And he said, correct, because you have had five husbands and the one you are with is not even your husband. You know, Jesus would have had every righteous right to say, Let's take you to the temple temple to be stoned. But instead, he had pleasant words and sweet, healing words for her going forward. What his presence did for her. What's another way that Jesus demonstrates kindness to people? Jesus gave healing to the bleeding woman in Jairus. This is in Luke chapter 8. And we heard some of these stories when we were going through the series in Mark, right? That healing was given. And we might think, okay, well, that's fine, but I don't have healing hands or healing pants legs like Jesus. Well, let's, let's work through this and then we'll, we'll talk that part out here. We remember this moment that a woman who had suffered from a chronic flow of blood for 12 years and could not be healed by anyone, she came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak, the hem of his garment, and immediately her bleeding stopped. What kindness is it that Jesus permitted his power to heal that woman? He gave this gift of healing. And we might even say that he gave her a physical gift that the physical situation she was in was no longer so because of the power that he had expressed. And we see this for Jairus' daughter. He was already on the way to Jairus' daughter when the woman interrupted him, and then his daughter appeared to die. And then Jesus said she was sleeping. They all laughed at him, right? And then he said, He, however, he took her by the hand and spoke forcefully, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned. She got up immediately. And he ordered that something be given to her to eat. Her parents were amazed, but he instructed them to tell no one. This gift of returning life, of raising the dead from life. Look at the power of God at display here. You ever have those things happen when you know God has provided for you, and this is not something you deserved It's not something you worked for, but it's merely his goodness acting, his kindness. I remember when I first moved to town here, we did not know how to pay rent. Not like five young adult boys knew how to pay rent. And what kindness was shown to us that just one month our rent was covered and we barely knew what happened. The kindness of God had acted through the hands of his church to do good to us that they were goodwilled and they were able, and not only that, but had acted to change that physical situation here. And again, I know, we do not have cloak tassels. Maybe that's our problem. Maybe that's why we can't heal people. No, I don't think that's it. Cloak tassels, pants legs, shoelaces, whatever it is, we don't have the same superstition that the power of God just flows off the dangling pieces of clothing that we have like they did then. We might not even be able to do some of those things. Were Were God willing? Of course it could happen. But is that normal? Not necessarily. 
But are we able to use the things God has given us? None of us can get out clean from that question. I'm not sorry about that. None of us can get out clean from having the ability to meet the urgent needs of others. It is not exactly like what Jesus did there. We might not have that same control over that power, but we have that same stewardship of things to help others. And we see one last one, and we might not really think of kindness when we hear this, but Jesus spoke plainly with the Pharisees. And you might think, hold up, Jesus was kind to the Pharisees? Was he? We might not find it that the way Jesus spoke to the Pharisees very kind. We might remember later on in Matthew, we have a whole section of scripture called the seven woes. Like, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you, which is the old school way to say, here's why you stink right now. Knock it off. We might not think of those things like kindness, now would we? <laughs> but let's take a look at where this happens and then maybe make sense of this. After the calling of Matthew, this dinner party was put together to celebrate this goodness that had come into Matthew's lives. And when the scribes of the, and the Pharisees saw that he, Jesus, was eating with sinners and tax collectors... They said to his disciples, why is he eating with tax collectors and sinners? And hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not those who are healthy that need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. In church, we might know that when Jesus said that, he was not saying that to assure his dinner guests. He was saying that to call out those that thought they were so righteous they didn't need any healing from the great Lord that we know. And real kindness keeps you from being dumb. Real kindness is when a lot of your friends are willing to tell you, hey, that's a really bad idea and you shouldn't do that. In fact, we could liken how Jesus is talking to the Pharisees here to that of an alarm clock. You know, one of our least favorite things we might interact with every day we're not going to talk about how much Carissa and I have fought with our alarm clock this week. Um, well, our alarm clocks are phones, so we haven't thrown it. But the feelings have certainly been there. And so we might say that what makes an alarm clock effective? Do you have these like sweet little dancing birdie tones that wake you up in the morning? If you do, I am so envious you can wake up that easily. That is not so for us. We would even say that how effective an alarm clock is, is directly related to how jarring the sound is. And alarm clocks are not bad things. Please trust me on that. Alarm clocks are not bad things. And so if the more jarring an alarm clock, the more effective it is, can you think about all of, again, that verse we heard from Romans earlier, how patient and kind God has been with the Pharisees and the scribes and the teachers of the law all this time, being patient with them, restraining until they, he just, they couldn't go on any longer without him telling you, you are so wrong. And we would say that the alarm clock method that Jesus chose with the Pharisees also progressed throughout scripture. And the very same thing I remember in high school because I had a zero hour class in high school, jazz band, so I had to be at the school at 6.30 in the morning. What a sick and twisted high schooler. And my friends and I realized I just wasn't waking up at my alarm clock. I didn't like my parents being an alarm clock. Alarm clock. We went way too far to the jarring awakeness there. So we had to find this middle ground between not Tweety Birds waking me up, but also not my parents, because I didn't, I didn't wake up to the Tweety Birds and nobody likes their parents waking them up. So we found this middle place, and so my best friends and I found, okay, the most effective alarm clock we could do is, one time we all hung out, and we, I said, hey, I need a better alarm clock, can you guys help me, what works for you? And they were like, we got you. And we pulled out my phone and recorded, and all of us just, ah, just screamed into it. 
best alarm clock ever until my parents are like, who's screaming? We might say that that was a little past the sweet spot to over-effective, but we would say that how effective that was, it, it fit, it worked. In the same way, Jesus' kindness with us is not always gonna be a gentle hand. Jesus' kindness with the Pharisees was not some gentle hand that said, hey, buddy, you know you're, you're mistreating the law of Moses, right? They had that moment. They, we could even say they had the Samaritan woman moments of his patience. And it took a little bit louder a voice and a little bit more stern a tongue to wake them up from the way they were acting. We would even look at it in the following way. We see what it says in Ephesians 2. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our wrongdoings, like the Pharisees and these people, like it's easy to make fun of the Pharisees, the scribes and tax collectors, am I right? And then we remember we're not too far off and then we're convicted. It's easy to feel that way, but we remember even when we were dead in our wrongdoings, he made us alive together with Christ. It's by grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come, he might show the boundless riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ. And do you see the thought of this scripture of like, hey, there's good news and here's the bad news. You're dead in your wrongdoings. But here's this great thing that's to come. And the boundless riches of his grace and kindness in Christ. Think about this new life we find in Jesus. How great are the riches of God's kindness. The things he does for us that are even grace, things that we don't deserve but he gives. How great are those riches going to be one day when we're in heaven celebrating and singing. How holy is the Lord. Think about how great that's going to be. It might take some plain speaking for us to get to that place, even in Christ, that we would repent. So let me lead you to this here. Similar question to earlier. Love is kind. And we've seen some of this. Jesus' love is kind. This is not normally a question that we should ask in church, right? We want to be selfless, but we need to also have some introspection here to look inward. What about me? Am I kind like Jesus is kind? And some of us might look inward and say, yeah, well, if I think about how I was when I was growing up, forget that I was apart from Christ. I'm a lot kinder now than I used to be. You might even say, well... Yesterday was a bad day. So yeah, I'm way kinder than before. We might find some way to do some mental gymnastics to justify our kindness as if it's really much more than it is when tested. But are we really kind like Jesus? Do we really have a goodwill towards those around us, even in the church? Do we look at one another and think, I just want that everything good possible for you. We might see that somebody's lacking in that. And do we have the ability to address those needs? Were somebody needing, would you be able to say, hey, I've got that, you can borrow it. I've got that, you can have it. Would we actually do that? I know in my heart that every single one of us says yes in our minds to these things. I also know that Personally, I've struggled to do that last part. To do kindness, not just have nice words. And I'm pretty sure I can't be the only person in the room with that conviction. And I don't mean to make you feel bad, unless that makes you more like Christ, and then I do mean to make you feel bad. All for the goodness of the gospel, right? but I know I feel bad. I feel that conviction. This week, you know, I thought, you know, I, I knew that, that this, this Sunday was coming up and that I had, uh, I had 
you know, prepared all of my stuff for the sermon, but, you know, I'm also teaching, so there's the whole whirlwind of figuring all that out. And the conviction just came week after week of where I lack in kindness. When we say what about me and we realize that we're maybe lacking in kindness in some ways, maybe we got a little bit of thinking to do and a little bit of planning to do. So the next time the opportunity for kindness comes up, we go through this process of like, hey, am I, am I good-willed towards this person? Am I able to do something about this? Am I going to do it? We should use wisdom with these things, but we should also be able to work through that thought process. Is, is the kindness of God in me to show love to the people around me? You might remember from earlier that kindness is this combination of being good-willed, being able to act, and taking action. And we might even find a shorter definition to say that kindness can also almost be called a useful goodness. That's all you take from me this morning, just kindness is a useful goodness. And we do this because our God was kind to us in the first place. And if kindness is a useful goodness, then we ought to make use of that. And were we to find that we have a lot of goodness in us, but we don't do it, that's maybe what we'd call a useless goodness. And ah, that kind of stings. Nobody wants to be called useless. But maybe we find that that's actually how we think about it. We just have nice words. And we can even wager that a useless goodness is no goodness at all. And that is not what we are called to in Christ. In fact, we see this as we are reminded in Ephesians chapter four, how we once were. All bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and slander must be removed from you along with all malice. That's like the opposite of kindness, am I right? That these things are not pleasant. These things are not what we ought to be. This should not be said of believers. But rather we follow what it leads to in 32. Be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. You know, as we look, as we look at this series, we might get to that last, get, get to this, this, it's behind all of our words here, right? But what does love have to do with kindness? Just ring a bell when we talk about first, first John 4, 9, that we love because Christ first loved us. That our capacity to love one another starts with a perfect example of it before us. And that if we love because Christ first loved us, we also know what it means to be kind because Christ was first kind to us. And again, we know that our best effort was falling short of the glory of God. So we're not the, Christ, the kindness of Christ leading us to repentance in the first place. We would have a really hard time doing what God calls us to in Scripture. But we can believe God never tells us to do something that he doesn't equip us to do. If we love someone, kindness should follow. And we know that the love that we are called to, this agape love, this unconditional, everyone ought to be a recipient love, should include the kindness of God being shown to them. We are called to model this love of Christ everywhere. And we see some of what this looks like in the biggest picture. What's the biggest act of kindness we see in scripture? It's the cross. This very thing we celebrate at communion, how exciting that we get to celebrate that. We remember the death of the Lord every time we come together and we break the bread and we drink the cup. We remember when the kindness of God, our savior, and his love for mankind appeared. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we did in righteousness, but in accordance with his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he richly poured out on us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. 
so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You know, that's just after where we started this morning. We talked about in Titus 3, 1 through 3, how wretched we were coming into this picture. And then look at this. The kindness of God has been poured out on us, that he loves us. His goodwill is abounding and flowing without end for us. And his kindness follows in the greatest act of kindness of all, in all history of all times. That at the cross, the goodwill of Christ compelled him to carry that cross bleeding and torn to the hill of Golgotha. It led him to that place where he took suffering that wasn't deserved, pain that wasn't his, and it wasn't just that he was good-willed enough, and it wasn't just that he was able to do it, but who other could have saved us from our sins than him who was perfect? So he was able to do it. But were Jesus just to have stopped at the garden of, I can save them, I'm willed enough to do it, but I'm not gonna act on it, that would be no kindness of God. That kindness of God died for you and me. That made us heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And then we think, do we imitate that Christ-sacrificial kindness in all that we do? Maybe this is a morning that, as believers, we know that we really fall short. And, you know, set aside my slightly hard on you moment earlier, we know from, from Philippians 1 that there is a work being started in us that will be completed at the day of Christ's coming. And that means if Christ does not come yet, we are still a work in progress here. Right? I am. I know I'm not the only one in the room. We are a work in progress being sanctified and transformed by the renewing of our minds and by the Holy Spirit within us. This is not a, I have now perfected this, let's move on. This is a ever-present process where we hope that God's continued patience and restraint with us will continue to lead us to repentance. That we would change our minds and therefore change our actions and we therefore would be changed. So maybe as believers, we have a bit of reflection to do. We know where we fall short. Maybe you have stories exactly like mine that you know maybe you haven't been a great brother a lot of the time or sister. Maybe you know that you have had so much capacity to good and you just drove by and you know you were not in so much a hurry to not help. Maybe it's those specific moments or maybe it's just the heart problem that I, I'm able to do things and I, and I do those things but I am not very nice. And I, I do the very opposite of what I'm called to do in Philippians, that instead of doing all things without grumbling and complaining, I do all things, but I also grumble and complain. Maybe that's the place where our kindness needs a little bit of reshaping. And maybe just some of the memory of what Christ has done for you on the cross is all you need to spur you forward. That the love of Christ compels us in all ministry and action and care. But if we're in a place that maybe this is some of the first times you've heard this, or maybe you're just so overdue, you've heard the gospel before, but you are, you kind of haven't really taken it seriously. I get that. That's how I was for a long time. You know how many times I heard the gospel until I took it seriously? I couldn't tell you because I probably can't count. Not that I can't count, I can't count how many times I've heard that, right? Uh, maybe this is the first time you really have to consider that there's a God that cares for you so much, his kindness died for you. And that means you really ought to respond to that. Maybe that for us breaks our hearts just like the first time it did. 
Let's sit in that. And let's do something about it. What's love got to do with kindness? Maybe they got to do part. Let's do something about this. So maybe this week going forward, you need to really try to look for opportunities to do kindness because God makes them very widespread for you. Maybe you have some things to make right that you could have been kinder for in the past. Maybe the thing you got to do is accept that kindness of God for the first time. To really hear the gospel again for the first time. To believe and be baptized for the sake of his name. To repent and to receive the Holy Spirit. If that's where you're at, there are so many people here that would love to help you, love to talk to you. I would love to. I know Joel's not here, but I know I can speak for him. He would love to talk to you. But let's not be in the place where we have this useless kindness that is no kindness at all. Let's not be East Coast, West Coast. Let's be Christ-like in our kindness. If you love somebody, you will take that choice. Let's pray together. As we go out singing, we celebrate his name. That he is indeed mighty to save us in all of his goodness and kindness. And let's go forward to change people every day.